positive view of, of how, the, how Virginia is a purple state, as the last two elections have now shown in national elections. But Ken Cuccinelli is, is not a purple state politician. He's very conservative. He's identified with the Tea Party in many respects. And I would think that he would want a convention that will ratify him and build him up to as a kickoff for the general election next year. So it seems some analysts are saying that the convention will be fairly conservative, more so than Northern Virginia. And that could either undercut you or undercut your ability to appeal to, to the whole state. I think that um, Ken is astute politically and he understands what type of a ticket he needs to have in order, and, and who an asset to the ticket will it be? be a ticket? Ken, you will, run, no. will you run holding hands and, you know, that, I mean, I mean yeah. well, yes, to be polite, but will you actually coordinate campaigns? First, I'll say Ken has is staying, is staying out of the lieutenant governor and attorney general's races right now. He's made that very clear, and I think that that is the right thing for him to do. Um, I think once the ticket is established, of course, we have to, we, you run separately. You, when you elect the governor, you don't automatically elect the lieutenant governor. It's a separate race. Um, and certainly any candidate would have to use that opportunity to let the general voting population know what they bring to them and how they, they can help them and how they can best represent them. Um, but I think you do have to run together um, talking about the principles of, of econ, you know, economic development, um, free markets. Can you be bipartisan? Those things are very important. Are you? Do you see yourself as a bipartisan person? Um, I have always worked very well with both parties. Tim and then Kane I, and, did that in his race for the Senate right. against George Allen. He said, "I am. I'll work with anyone to get something done, rather than the hard edge that George Allen ran." Right, and I have a record of doing that. But I'll be honest with you: when in the General Assembly, there are very few issues that are partisan; they're regional. When you look at the breakdown between people in in the General Assembly, it's typically the urban crescent versus the rural, and. Um, as much as the press likes to really promote the division between the parties, my experience in the General it's Assembly has been, no, but it's what you like to talk about most. Yeah. And what you really see in the General Assembly and an accurate depiction of any divisiveness is regional. It's really not party versus party. Um, there's a tremendous amount of legislation that passes every single year. They consider 3,000 bills a year on the average, and 900 or so will pass. Almost all of them are are pieces of legislation that enhance um, everyone's ability to, to live and to work, and, and they're, they're passed unanimously. Well, so well, I'll get back to that in a second, but we have to go to the telephones. Please don your headphones so that we can all hear what Rick in Falls Church, Virginia, has to say. Rick, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hey, Jean Marie, you sound like a nice lady, so I hope what I'm going to say doesn't offend you. But the Republicans have been talking about portraying themselves differently in order to get more votes. And the way they seem to be going about doing it is laughable. I've been following politics for 40 years, and it was obvious to me from the beginning and from reading the history of social programs and, and race relations that the Republican people are for, that the Republicans are for the wealthy people and the Democrats are for the poor and middle class. And I haven't seen anything to keep me from, from that opinion. And, and to be able to stand there like John Boehner does and claim that we shouldn't tax the wealthiest people in our country and for none of the Republicans to take a stand against that is, is unbelievable to most of us because we're not wealthy. And well, the, the allow me to have Jean Marie Davis respond. Do the Repu does the Republican Party march in lockstep? I, I think that's a generalization, and I think that your remarks are really targeted towards the federal um, government and what's going on federally. State and local government are so very different because the services we have to provide are local services. And so I think there needs to be a bifurcation between what's going on nationally and what goes on in the state and local level. But I'd like to point something out to you. Um, President Obama likes to talk about how the Democrats are the party of the middle class, and if that's the case, I guess I need to understand why in the free and reduced lunch program that was passed two years ago in the lame duck session with Democrats controlling the House and the Senate and the presidency, they demanded that the, free, that the uh, basic school lunch be increased. There's a floor ceiling to $2.50 per lunch. Now, that's important because in with in Wythe County, um, for example, in Virginia, they charge a dollar sixty. Now they have to sell, they have to they have to sell that lunch for ninety cents more per child per day, 
which is hundreds of additional dollars, and that hits middle class families more than it hits anybody else. And that's just one of many examples of how the middle class is being struck upside the head by Democrats. Um, I think Republicans nationally have fallen short of using examples just as the one that I used to help people understand that Democrats aren't any better for the middle class than the perception of Republicans. Um, there's plenty of blame to go around. Rick, thank you for your call. Well, let's, let's dive into social issues because that always